Here is Mary Ward in traveling dress. She was to go do a great deal of traveling, mostly on foot, in the years we shall look at today. By 1620, Mary Ward was sure of what she was called to do, to build an apostolic religious society for women on the model of the Society of Jesus, using every possible way of helping souls. She already has schools for girls in Saint-Omer and Liège, but also women working underground, as we say these days, pursuing spiritual conversations with people seeking faith, putting them in touch with priests, catechizing children and adults, facilitating journeys to the continent, for children trying to get to Catholic schools and young women trying to get to convents that they wanted to enter. Visiting Catholics in prison and all this by any means possible, which must have called for ingenuity and initiative. The sisters were not necessarily living in community any more than the English Jesuits. But like them, under a superior with whom they would meet when they could. We have an account from a sister Dorothea, real identity unknown, who lived with Lady Chimpley at him in Plesham Hall in Suffolk, ostensibly as a Lacom lady companion, but often traveling around as a district nurse or catechist there would have been others in similar occupations. We should never forget that. Schools for girls were only ever part of the plan and impossible in Recuse and England. The earlier part of 1621 was spent in establishing two new communities in Cologne and Trier. They're rather a shadowy part of the history. Not much is known about them, but they are evidence that some people in authority were impressed by the English ladies as they came to be known. Prince Bishop Ferdinand of Liège and Nuncio Albergati of Cologne had requested these two houses. <clears throat> Mary Ward also paid a courtesy visit to the Archduchess in Brussels, the Infanta Isabella Clara Eugenia. But on the 21st of October, 1621, the party was ready to set off from Liège. We have the details from the brief relation. With Mary Ward in her pilgrim's dress were four companions, here you can see two of them, the others will be behind the horses, a maid, a priest, Father Henry Lee, nephew of Father Roger Lee, a gentleman, Robert Wright, a relation on her mother's side, he and Father Henry were to be faithful supporters of the many journeys in years to come and a serving man, two horses, one to carry the baggage and another to ease who should be weary. They walked to Rome across the Alps with only three rest days, one in Nancy to write letters, one in Milan to honor the great Archbishop, St. Charles Borromeo, and a day to pray at the shrine of Our Lady in Loreto. The brief relation tells us about her prayer and what followed. She took for her part and portion to labor and suffer for Christ, having lively represented to her the much she was to suffer, which was caused that as soon as she beheld St. Peter's church from 16 miles off Rome, she knelt down and profoundly inclined and rendered all submission to that holy seat and chair of St. Peter's successors. 
personal letters from Juan Bautista Vives, the Infanta's ambassador to the Holy See, to her secretary in Brussels, give some idea of what the cause of suffering is likely to be. He says that the business will be very complicated because it contains great difficulties. For him, the chief, are that the ladies want to be subject directly to the Pope and not to the diocesan bishop, and that, that they want to be religious with vows without enclosure. Events were to prove that he was right. Mary Ward's letter to the Infanta, written on the 1st of January, 1622, tells her that they had arrived on Christmas Eve. And here you see the Milvian Bridge, which they would have entered from the north and crossed over into the Via Flaminia, which leads to the Flaminian Gate, probably two miles further along. Having gone under the Flaminian Gate, here on this picture, they would have crossed the Piazza del Popolo, taken this extreme right road, and that would have got them to the Tiber Bank and eventually to St. Peter's. This, of course, is a modern view, and neither the city nor, in fact, St. Peter's Square would have been precisely like that when Mary Ward arrived. But this gives some sense of the place. On the following Sunday, they sent a message to Vives. On Monday, he came to see them. And on Tuesday, he accompanied them to an audience with Pope Gregory XV. Monseigneur Vives told the Holy Father who they were, especially your Highness's favour and affection for us, and your ardent desire that His Holiness would favour us with bulls of confirmation. To this, His Holiness, with a benevolent expression, replied, God provides for the Church in its needs, adding that there was great need for the reformation of the female sex in those areas that is, the countries of Northern Europe. Then he asked various questions about their way of life, and Monseigneur Vives replied as well or better than we could have done ourselves. In fact, Vives seems to have done all the talking. The conversation would have been in Latin. Mary Ward understood it perfectly well, but it was not seemly for a woman to address the Pope. His Holiness promised that the business would be entrusted to the Congregation of Cardinals, according to Mary Wall. In fact, the Congregation for Bishops and Regulars, the body responsible for matters concerning religious life. Mary goes on to tell the Infanta that she has also been able to visit the Father General of the Jesuits, Muzio Bitoleski. Sorry, this is a picture of very poor quality. Doesn't flatter him at all, but gives perhaps some idea. She delivered letters to him, and he received her very favorably promising that he and his men would do their best to help. As we shall see, he kept his promise as far as possible, given his primary duty to the society and the strict ruling of their seventh general congregation, that Jesuits were not to involve themselves in the affairs of religious women beyond hearing their confessions in church. He must also have been well aware, as Vives was, of the official church position on women's orders. The first few days in Rome had been promising, but time went on 
and nothing happened. So Mary Ward wrote many letters asking for support. One of the first steps was to ask permission to begin a school for girls so that they should, could show their way of life in action. And this was granted in August 1622. They had settled in near the English College, which you see here, the chapel. And if you look at the next picture, you can just see the chapel door, so it gives you an idea of the scale of things. And about down here, we come to the corner of Via Montoro and the next street, uh, Via Monserrato and the next street. Via Monserrato, by the way, usually looks rather dark and gloomy. And, uh, it's a very narrow street, tall houses, typical Roman darkness. And here is the corner. This side is Via Monserrato. That side is Via Montoro. And this, actually, the lower part of the house is still now as it would have been then, though the upper part has been altered over the centuries. And here you have the other street name, Via Montoro. The inscription was only put up in 2012, and it says, the Venerable, Venerable Mary Ward, founder of the Congregation of Jesus, and of the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary. In Rome, from the years 1622 to 1625, with her English companions, she founded a school for the children of poor children of the neighboring district in Via Monserrato. So imagine this is the place where they were. And they were, of course, very close to the English College, designedly because it was English company and several of them actually had brothers in the English College, so it was very important to them. In February 1623, Mary Ward wrote to the Infanta that about 120 girls of various ages and social backgrounds attended the school. The mothers accompanied those who were too old to be allowed to walk the streets alone, which is an interesting piece of social insight, and met them again after school. A list of the community is to be found in the church records at San Lorenzo in Damaso from about that time. 11 members, including apparently two Italians. The sisters were involved in catechesis in their parish church. But Mary also tells the Infanta how the beginnings of the Roman school had been overshadowed for her by the sickness and death of her younger sister, Barbara. The necrology tells how in June 1622, it pleased his divine majesty to visit us all, saving one, with a kind of sickness not unlike to the smallpox. All recovered except Barbara, who went on suffering complications of bronchial infection and fever. She spent some weeks learning Italian in the Torre dei Specchi, the convent of Santa Francesca Romana, in a healthier part of the city on higher ground. But neither that nor a stay outside Rome, probably by the sea in Nettuno, where we stayed so long as our provision would hold out, brought any lasting help, and she died on the 25th of January, 1623. Prayers were offered by many in Rome, especially in the English College where she was buried and in the Jesu where Father General 
order that all the masses that day should be said for her. And here you have the English College Chapel and the memorial tablet, which is actually somewhere there on the left, we can't see it, saying that buried in the church of St. Thomas of the English of the society whose foundress was Mary Ward, Barbara Ward, who died on the 25th of January, 1623, together with two more of the first companions, Elizabeth Cotton and Barbara Babsall, and a slightly later person who was the fourth superior general who died in 1697. There were other pressing problems, not least financial. So she decided on a new venture in Naples, encouraged by the fact that it was under Spanish rule and hoping that the Infanta's patronage would be helpful. She also asked for Father Vitaleski's help. In his reply, he says that had she asked, he would have advised her not to go. But since she is already on the way, he has asked the fathers in Naples to do all they can to help. She had set off on the 12th of May, 1623, with Winifred Wigmore, seen in the picture here, which we also have in the Bar Convent, and Susanna Rookwood, with Father Lee, Robert Wright, and the Serving Man. She was ill when they arrived. A friend procured her the loan of a house, but there was absolutely no furniture. A priest, possibly the Jesuit procurator, Father Corcione, went to a wealthy lady parishioner to say it was a shame for her to have so many beds in her house while the servant of God was lying on the ground. And soon there were beds at least. By November, the school was beginning to flourish. The sisters were on good terms with the Jesuits, for whom they sent and received letters by their own post. They began to make enough money to send to other communities in need. By July 1624, there were postulants and novices, and Winifred was in charge of them. Meanwhile, in January 1624, Mary Ward had set off again to Perugia, invited by a widow called Ottavia Caini. On the 6th of February, she writes to Father Edward Coffin in the English College in Rome that she has been constantly interrupted by streams of lady visitors, superabundant in their compliment and their discourse not only eloquent, but of such continuance that one chamber full of them, beginning at one o'clock, are scarcely at six o'clock come to their usual conclusion. If you need anything, dear lady, count on me. The house and church, which the bishop have given us, we have seen, and I wish ours had the like rent free in Rome. The air and situation is so good. But what of the petition to the Pope in all this time? The congregation of bishops and regulars had discussed it in several meetings, but made no progress by the time Gregory XV died on the 8th of July, 1623. On the 6th of August, Cardinal Maffeo Barberini became Pope Urban VIII. This time, Mary Ward had no influential help in gaining an audience. By now, 
Vives had evidently lost interest and patience, as perhaps had the Infanta herself. But in October 1624, he was at Mondragoni, a country villa near Frascati, outside Rome. <clears throat> she set off there with three others of the Roman community, telling no one outside of it of her intentions and succeeded in being admitted. Perhaps the Pope in holiday mood was feeling indulgent. Perhaps he was curious about these English ladies of whom he'd heard. She gives a full account in a letter to Winifred Wigmore in Naples. She told him that they had lived their calling for 16 years in various countries, that they had received approval from Pope, Pope Paul VI, but needed confirmation of it so that parents would pay diaries to the members as they were suffering through lack of financial support. He had answered mildly that he knew their business had been discussed and would investigate when he returned to Rome. She goes on, the manner of his carriage was very pleasing and grateful, his countenance very contentful. She asked that the matter might be discussed by a small group. There were about 60 members of the congregation hitherto dealing with it. His last words were that he would do in it as God should inspire him. He appointed a particular cardination, congregation of four cardinals. By the end of January 1625, she knew that it had spoken against confirmation. And in April, Pope Urban VIII ordered the full congregation of bishops and regulars to suppress all three of the English ladies' Italian houses. His reasons were, they're living a common life following a rule, their uniform dress and their refusal of enclosure. In fact, they were living as religious while refusing to do what the church required of religious women. Nothing is known of what happened in Perugia, but it was still in its early stages. A year earlier, in April 1624, there had been no borders and only seven day pupils. In Rome, the mothers protested to Cardinal Nellini, the vicar general, to Donna Costanza Barberini, the Pope's sister-in-law and a great friend and supporter of Mary Ward, and to other influential people, but to no effect. The school was not allowed to reopen in October, and in November, the community was forced to leave the house, despite the landlord's protestation that they'd already paid the rent in advance. They moved to a house in the parish of Santa Maria dei Monti, which is quite near the Colosseum. The closure of the Naples house was more difficult because Naples was subject to the King of Spain, nephew of the Infanta, who was known as patron of Mary Ward, and the school had Jesuit support. The Archbishop died not long after he received the order to suppress. His successor was not appointed till March 1626, and the Neapolitans were in no hurry to lose their school. The new archbishop was forced to close it in summer 1629. The Neapolitans protested in September and there was a partial reopening. According to Mother Immolata Vetter's research in the Inquisition archives, there was still a Jesuitess called Anna 
living in Naples with some other women in 1631, six years after the official closure, very Roman. But it's easy to see why Mary Ward prayed so much in Roman churches in 1625 and 1626, as she watched all this happening. This is the time of the graces recorded in the painted life, of which you see two of them here. Here she's in the church of St. Peter's Chains, and she's receiving the insight that her greatness consisted not in the favor and support of princes and great persons, but in free and open access to God. In the next one, which is Sant'Eligio in the street, just one street beyond the English college, she has the grace to see the need for forgiving enemies. From this time on, there was a sort of wry joke among the companions that it was better to be Mary Ward's enemy than her friend, because you got more of her prayers. And it's not surprising that she decided that she could achieve no more in Rome and set off north on the 10th of September, November, 1626, with Mary Points, Elizabeth Cotton, Anne Turner, and the faithful male escorts. The Italian Vita says she left Rome because of business in Flanders and England. But she took letters of recommendation from Father Vitaleschi to the Jesuit confessors of Elector Maximilian I in Munich and of Emperor Ferdinand and his wife in Vienna. There's also a testimon testimonial letter from Cardinal Trejo y Panagua, the one who had been cured by Mary Ward's prayers. This is where they're going on pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady on Monte Giovino. The Cardinal stated that she was traveling to Germany and other countries north of the Alps. Probably her intention was to seek financial support for the Northern Houses, possibly encouraged by the fact that Elector Maximilian had just made a large donation to the Jesuits in Liège. But an encounter on the way suggests that she may already have had another motive. She stopped in Florence to visit the Grand Duchess Maria Magdalena of Tuscany and her mother-in-law, the Grand Duchess Christina, sister of the Electress Elizabeth of Bavaria. Grand Duchess Christina gave Mary Ward a letter of recommendation to her brother-in-law, Elector Maximilian, commending her intention of founding a house of her order in Bavaria. This is the first mention we've ever had of any such idea. Did Mary Ward speak to the two noble ladies about her hopes of financial help? And did they suggest that the elector might be more inclined to give money for a work in his own country? There's no knowing, but the incident shows how Despite the grace received in Rome, she used the help of princes and great persons wherever possible, as was the custom at that time, and as Ignatius himself had done. By Christmas Eve, Mary was at Feldkirch in Tyrol, where she spent long hours praying in the church in as great a cold as I think was ever felt. Mary points, whom you see here, tells us in the brief relation. And she knew she was one of the group. 
On the 7th of January, 1627, they arrived in Munich, where they were received graciously by Elector Maximilian and his wife. Here is the Elector Maximilian, and this is a very spruce modern view of the Electoral Palace. Maximilian already knew something of the English ladies. There's a long letter to him from George Talbot, Earl of Shrewsbury, recommending their work, dated the 3rd of October, 1620. And he lost no time in granting them the use of a large house in the city center called the Paradisa House with a quarterly allowance for expenses the first time they had ever had financial security from anywhere. Alas, we have no picture of the Paradiser House itself. These are a couple of tapestry pictures of it. But here on the right, you can see a street in Munich, which gives some idea of the kind of buildings that we'd be talking about at that time. The Paradiser House and the Elector's support were to play a vital role in the future existence of the Institute, as we shall see. In an excited letter of the 16th of February, Mary summoned Barbara Babthorpe from the Ayrshire asking her to bring members for the new foundation. And by June, the Munich house was well enough established for Mary to set off for Vienna, armed with letters to Emperor Ferdinand II, Maximilian's brother-in-law. The emperor also received her graciously and gave her a large house called Schloss am Himmel, which could be roughly translated skyscraper, as it was taller than usual at the time it was built. Four stories, housing eight families. This is a little bit of the house to see with the inscription. In this house opened in Mary Ward, 1585 to 1645, foundress of the Congregation of Jesus, formerly the English ladies, opened in 1628, the first open girls' school in Vienna. And this is a more close-up view of what you'll see is very like the Jesuit monogram, which Mary Ward had adopted for herself. As far as we know, that's the first time it's actually appeared on a building. Like the elector, Emperor Ferdinand provided a regular income. The people of Vienna were enthusiastic. The school soon had over 400 day pupils and just a few boarders, with a community of 11 sisters, three English and eight German. So evidently, novices were already coming to Munich. They were young. The oldest member was aged 39. Three were still novices. And two of them who were already teaching were aged only 17 and 18, respectively. But the Cardinal Archbishop, Melchior Clason, was away in Rome. When he returned late in January 1628, he was not pleased. He wrote an angry letter to Cardinal Bandini, Vicar General in Rome. In this city, there are certain ladies called Jesuitesses, professed of three vows who, without my knowledge and consent, have set up a school for girls, not wishing to be subject to any ordinary, but solely to their general, 
depending on his imperial majesty alone. Furthermore, the said ladies produced a comedy a few days ago with the aforesaid girls of the school. The general superior of these women is going on to Hungary, introducing this order of hers everywhere that it is allowed under the said imperial protection. She was indeed. To the city now called Bratislava, capital of the Slovak, Slovak Republic, but then called Presburg in Germany, Poshon in Hungary, and the seat of government for independent Hungary. And this is an old print in which you can see very clearly the general lie of the land of the city. Then you've got the river Danube in the foreground. You've got the left hand hill with this, the castle. Then you have more hills and you have nearest to the castle, you have the Cathedral of St. Martin, which you can still see today. And there seems to have been a house somewhere on this side of the cathedral where the sisters had their house. The larger part of Hungary had been occupied by the Turks for over a century. The invitation had come from Cardinal Peter Pazman, primate of Hungary and the Jesuit. He was convinced that education was vital for preserving and promoting the Catholic faith. He'd already founded two universities and several schools for boys. And especially important for him was the education of women. He wanted a school for girls as a twin school to his Jesuit college for boys. After a long wrangle with the mostly Lutheran town council, he found a house for them near St. Martin's Cathedral. And by mid-March 1628, the small but international community had arrived. Barbara Babthorpe was superior with one Italian sister and two Germans. On the 6th of July, Barbara Babthorpe wrote at some length to Winifred Wigmore, by then in Munich, describing the house and the archbishop's kindness. A few days earlier, he had invited her to dinner and spoken with her in Italian. He had been amused to hear of the variety of nationalities in so small a community. He had also taken a practical interest, inquired what they had to eat, and sent them a whole hog fat and great. Barbara also reports on the school. We have scholars essay, that is enough. But the poor goes to work in the vineyards the rich attend unconstantly, so as how many we have, we cannot tell. But her whole account has a happy feeling about it. Cardinal Pazman, who understood and approved Mary Ward's aims, was to be a loyal friend and supporter who protected his community of English ladies for as long as he could. Mary Ward herself was still on the move. In mid-March 1628, she had been in Poshon, Presburg. On the 6th of May, she was writing to Winifred Wigmore from Prague about hopes for a foundation. And that was why Winifred was already in Munich because Mary's idea was that Winifred Wigmore might be superior of the Prague Foundation. Some months earlier, they had been invited by Count Altal, who offered them a house and a spacious church. 
The emperor, who also had the title of King of Bohemia, was in favor. And the nobility were enthusiastic because, quote, education for the female sex is very necessary for the defense of the Catholic faith. But what Mary Ward had not understood was the extent of opposition from official church quarters. Ernst Adalbert von Harrach had become Archbishop of Prague in 1623, aged 25, cardinal a year later. He was bitterly against the emperor and the Jesuits because Ferdinand had given the presidency of Prague University to the Jesuits, ignoring the archbishop's rights as chancellor to make the appointment. The nuncio in Vienna, Carlo Carafa, was also hostile. Even worse, there was the newly appointed nuncio extraordinary to the emperor, Giovanni Battista Palotto, age 34, who had arrived in Prague only on the 26th of May. Both nuncios wrote on the 7th of June to Cardinal Francesco Barberini, the Pope's nephew. Both are negative, but Polotto's language is more barbed. Here in Prague, he says, the Jesuitesses are aspiring to have a parish church and using their influence with the emperor to push the archbishop into letting them have it. Their English superior and founders wants to be on par with the Jesuit general. They refuse to be subject to the fathers of the society or to the ordinary or to the ministers of the Holy See, that is to the nuncios. Grave consequences are to be feared from their not wanting to have control from the ecclesiastical prelate who would govern and watch over them and over the practices and doctrines which they would teach to a sex so fragile and liable to fall into errors of intellect and will. All through the summer, Palotto went on writing letters to bishops and nuncios all over Europe inquiring about Jesuitesses in their jurisdiction, but especially to Barberini. It was clear to him that the question of the English ladies would only be settled in Rome. Either their institute must be confirmed and subject to proper supervision, or they must be kept from returning to Prague and causing trouble, including, of course, trouble for him. He also had several meetings with Mary Ward, in the course of which his attitude to her gradually changes. At first, he writes, now that I have talked to this woman, I'm even more afraid of her. She seems to me more than a woman and she thinks herself more than a man. Later, he refers to her more kindly as Donna Maria and Donna Maria della Guardia, the Italian version of her surname. In November, he sees her three times and persuades her that she must go back to Rome. As a result, he has made official nuncio at the Imperial Court a titular archbishop, and shortly afterwards, cardinal. His attitude to Mary Ward is not simple. On the one hand, he's definitely using her as a tool for his own advancement. On the other, later there are friendly letters, and much later, an invitation to her to stay in his villa in Tuscany which she is unable to accept because of her health. 
Meanwhile, in Rome, the Congregation of Propaganda, this is the propaganda building in Piazza di Spagna, rather forbidding looking place, decided with strong support from Urban VIII that all Mary Ward's houses everywhere should be suppressed. Propaganda was less than 10 years old at that time, founded to deal with missionary countries, which at that time included England, as England was in the hands of the Anglican Reformation. No doubt the correspondence from Prague contributed to the decision, along with the developments in Munich and Vienna. It's understandable that while she was in Italy in the earlier years, the authorities must have had the sense that she was under their eyes and that need could be kept under control. Now she was far away in mid-Europe and had won the favor and protection of two of the most powerful lay leaders of the time. What else might she get up to? No immediate steps were taken, and Mary Ward herself was not informed. But in October, Barberini wrote to Palotto that Elizabeth Keyes, the superior in Rome, and the other sisters knew about the decree against them. In late 1628, Mary was not able to go straight from Vienna to Rome. She returned to Munich, fell ill, and was not able to travel. She was seriously ill for a month, but was determined to travel as soon as she could. On the 2nd of January, 1629, she set off, though the physicians said she would die before she left the city gates. She was unable to eat anything but thin oatmeal gruel, which she could only keep down for about half an hour. The colds were extreme and snows excessive. This was the time that she was asked whether she thought she would live until the end of the journey. And she replied that it was more likely that she would not. Neither did it import her where or when she died, in her bed or under a hedge, provided she were found faithful. For the rest, she was sure, lived she or died she, she served a good master. If, like me, you first met those words in the little book, Maxims of Mary Ward, you may also share my conviction that her sayings are so much more powerful when they're met in context.